Um, I have um, with us uh, Mary Brown. She's a uh, director of government affairs for Cisco Systems. She's been with the company since 2004, and before that, she was in uh, private practice, um, and then also at the Federal Communications Commission for about 10 years. Um, on second, I'm going to go in order. Uh, Alex Lind is vice president of mobile and digital apps for the Weather Company. Um, he's been with the company since 2012. Before that, um, he was with Yahoo. Um, he's actually an engineer, which is great, and I've been using his um, uh, Weather Channel app. Um, <laughs> frenetically for the past uh, 24 hours because uh, as an idiot I did a, an event in a tent. Um, and then the third, we have Shala Rath uh, with Verizon. Uh, before that, she was with Verizon Communications. She is quite possibly one of the coolest names in the industry. If you were to write a, if you were to do a screenplay on an action adventure movie, and your 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 heroine was this uh, really strong woman, uh, Shala Rath would be who you would name that character. So any screenwriters out there? Um, and so, but Charlotte, Charlotte is responsible for a lot of the uh, uh, spectrum uh, needs at, at, Ver at Verizon. Um, uh, interesting, she has a, a degree in, in, in foreign service, and she has her master's in science technology um, from George Washington University. Um, uh, then fourth is Derek Khanna. He's a contributor for the National Review, um, Forbes, and The Atlantic. Um, he's a Yale Law, Law Fellow with the Information Society Project. You've probably seen him in the news or read his blog. He's been all over the place recently. Um, and then next, we have David Don, who's with Comcast. Um, he's the Executive Director of Regulatory Affairs. Um, and, and then last, certainly not least, is Michael Calabrese from the New America Foundation Open Technology Initiative. And Michael has his law degree from uh, Stanford and his business degree from Stanford as well. Um, one thing I forgot to mention about David was that he also, like Shala, has a degree in foreign service. So um, that's, the, that's the panel. As I said, we're trying to mitigate a broadband disaster. This panel came out of a, a committee process, which I said before is a terrible way to plan a conference. Um, and the idea, everybody said, well, um, even if we were to like seat a commissioner and a Republican commissioner and a chairman in the Federal Communications Commission and have incentive auctions like tomorrow, we are years away from building next generation broadband networks based on available spectrum or what spectrum could become available. We are many, many years away. Uh, what do we do uh, in the meantime? How do we mitigate um, what everybody says is a broadband squeeze and, and some of our panelists can describe some of those things more, more in much better detail than I can. But what do we do in the meantime? Um, you know, we will be doing briefings in the Capitol complex on incentive auctions and those rules and things like that. And we'll be doing all of that. But right now we're trying to say, what are, the, what are the broadband networks of the future look like? And let me just offer you uh, one anecdote about this panel. Uh, many years ago, probably a dozen years ago, the Congressional Internet Caucus launched a wireless task force. They wanted a few members to kind of like look at wireless internet issues, which a dozen years ago, there wasn't a whole lot of. Um, they appointed Senator John Ensign um, from the Senate and uh, Congressman Mike Honda. Um, and at the inaugural event, um, uh, Congressman Han, uh, Congressman uh, Senator Ensign stood up and he made a great speech and he said he was holding his StarTAC you know, 300 uh, feature phone, which was a really smoking hot device at the time, and he said, this is the future, uh, wireless, wireless networks are the future of, 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 of the internet. And, uh, and it was interesting because he was holding up his phone. And then Congressman Honda got up and he said, I have just launched an initiative to get, get Wi-Fi all across the National Mall using the Smithsonian buildings. He launched, he was pushing for the Smithsonian to launch Wi-Fi networks and things like that. And he said, Wi-Fi is the future of you know, the, the, wire, the wireless internet. And I sat there and I said, I, I, is this a binary choice? And over the years, I've been kind of wondering, you know, which direction does this go? Is it like unlicensed kind of small cell technologies or is it our carrier network? Is it a complementary matter of both? And I certainly don't know the answer to either of those. But I, I think what this panel was designed to do is kind of look at the, the future in the interim till we get more robust spectrum out there and say, what are we doing to mitigate some of those issues? So let me just start, and that's my opening, and I'm sorry I'm talking so quickly because I'm a little bit behind, and the only thing standing between this panel and drinks is this panel. So let me just go quickly down the list. Just some opening comments on, on that question is like, you know, how, networks of the future, what are we going to do to mitigate this issue? How are we going to respond um, uh, to, the, to the squeeze? Um, for example, uh, many years ago, um, when, when the iPhone was introduced in the AT&T network, there was, as we know, when, when smartphones go onto a network, the like data usage goes up tremendously. And AT&T really pioneered um, kind of the Wi-Fi offload to kind of deal with some of those issues. And, and people find creative ways. So we're going to talk about that uh, through the course of this panel, hopefully have a conversation, and I'm going to try to get questions um, from you, even if you have a drink in your hand. So let me start off with Mary, and then sure. we'll go down the list. Sure. Well, Tim, thanks for having me. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to talk to you today. So I think, um, I think 
the start of this panel has to really uh, touch on the events three years ago when the Federal Communications Commission launched their national broadband plan. And in that plan, they said that we're going to need 300 megahertz of spectrum in five years and 500 megahertz of spectrum in 10 years. For those of you who are not radio people, that is an astonishing amount of radio spectrum. No regulator in the world had ever spoken words that ambitious before. It was huge. And now we're sitting here in the spring of 2013, and where are we? Well, even though the Congress and the FCC and the administration have been working away to try to identify this 300 megahertz or 500 megahertz of spectrum, we are well short of the goal. Right? We have things in progress, the incentive auction proceeding at the FCC, the NTIA examining whether there's federal spectrum. But as we sit here today, we are well short of the goal. In the meantime, all of you on your mobile devices, as I look around the room, um, are using them. And Cisco is estimating that between 2012 and 2017, your use of those devices is going to produce traffic growth that is, um, that is enormous. It's 56% compound annual growth rate by 2017. That number may not mean much to you. You may think, how steep is that? That is very, very steep. I went on the internet this afternoon and said, what's the compound annual growth rate of the number of cars in the world? It's around 6%. And you think about China and India, right? And all the people buying cars in the third world. That's growing 3%. Or another indicator, how many smartphone units are being sold? That's a compound annual growth rate in the low to mid 20s, depending on which analyst you look at. So a 56% compound annual growth rate in the traffic you are generating off those devices is very, very steep. So uh, what's happening in order to be able to cope with that in the absence of spectrum? Because we really haven't advanced the ball that far from 2010. Well, the short answer, Tim, is everything, all of the above, right? We're trying everything. We are, the carriers are optimizing the spectrum they have. You guys have seen some of the merger uh, uh, cases uh, uh, that have been raised and resolved. Uh, the carriers are investing heavily. There's additional uh, cell towers. There's the advent of a new technology, 4G technology, called long-term evolution that's far more efficient than 3G. There's uh, investment in backhaul technologies to get your traffic back to the internet faster. All of this investment is happening. Um, and, and in addition to that, the other thing that we're seeing, and a, a, an important point here uh, on the use of spectrum, is that we're increasingly seeing this traffic move to Wi-Fi at a much faster rate than we had before. And that is for a couple reasons. One, your devices are making it easier for you to use Wi-Fi, right? I choose Wi-Fi, I get connected to my network at home automatically when my <coughs> iPhone, when I walk in the door, it automatically connects to my home Wi-Fi. But it's also because carriers themselves are pushing you to Wi-Fi. You may not know it. When I walk in to Starbucks, my smartphone will automatically uh, get pushed onto that Wi-Fi network operated by AT&T at Starbucks. They're pushing you onto that to get you off of the high-powered spectrum that's becoming increasingly scarce. So that's a really critical trend that we're starting to see. But it's not an answer to the spectrum problem. I mean, we are sitting here right now, today, in a Wi-Fi black hole. Right? There's no Wi-Fi in this tent. Nope. Right? So, so it's not, Wi-Fi cannot replace the, the uh, mobility spectrum that the carriers are using. So, but it's any port in a storm at this, at this stage. Alex. 
Perfect. So I, I'm here to provide a little bit of a different perspective. We're a publisher, and to give you numbers, we're about the three by 100, as we're saying. We're about 100 million audience on TV, about 100 million on our weather.com property, and 100 million downloads on our apps. So it would seem like we're a fairly balanced business. We split our business across these different screens to get the weather. However, if you look at the trends, it, it, it's very different. It, to give you an idea, we get around one and a half times the amount of traffic on our mobile applications that we do on our weather.com site. But right now, we're only making about 50% the revenue. And this is a big, we're in a tough spot there for a publisher because that's not static. We're seeing that audience ever shift more to mobile. And while um, there's a lot of talk around the tech sectors around second screens, for example, people sat in front of the TV, using their laptop, using their phone in front of the TV. If you talk to the younger members of our, uh, of our audience, uh, you ask them about second screening, they give you a crazy look, right? There's no second screen, there's only one screen, and that's the phone. And whether it's video, whether it's content, whether it's the weather, whatever it is, all of that is happening through the phone. So we as a publisher have to make sure that the value exchange, my, uh, my IAB associate talked about earlier, that value exchange between us providing the weather content for free, which is not an easy thing. We have a couple of hundred meteorologists, we have a big organization. Us being able to provide that weather content for free is very dependent upon us solving this mobile monetization uh, a challenge, I guess is the word. And uh, whether that's video advertising, whether that's uh, advertising through different types of display formats, we have to make that work on mobile. And frankly, the, the more time we spend, the more money we look at making, those formats get ever, uh, ever heavier in terms of their bandwidth usage. A video pre-roll, 15, 30 second video, that, that's an inordinate amount of bandwidth compared to some of the smaller formats from before. The ads themselves, people have probably seen get more interactive, they get more content, they get in terms of 3D. Uh, if we are not given the opportunity to deliver that type of content, that type of content that advertisers are willing to pay us good money for, we can see substantial businesses, you know, traditional publishing businesses, just disappear because those audiences are shifting to mobile. And while I think consumers will find a way, developers will find a way to give, make those services available, they won't be able to make that quality of content available unless we have the bandwidth, the spectrum to put those ads out that we need to get the money for. Thanks. Um, thanks. Thanks, too. I appreciate the opportunity to come and speak to you today. And I, I guess I was thinking among my superpowers that uh, I have um, is this ability to look into the future and try and figure out what it is that um, we will need as a company with Verizon in terms of our spectrum holdings. And one thing that I wanted to talk about, the, in a way, there are two, there are two parts of our spectrum, um, uh, the way we look at spectrum. One is what we've got today, how we build the network, how we um, you know, meet the needs of the consumers. And then part of what I'm supposed to be doing is because Spectrum, getting access to Spectrum, as Mary was alluding to, is a very, very, you know, it's a much longer term type of um, activity than I think a lot of us are used to dealing with. I mean, when we think about sort of almost near term in the Spectrum world, we're not talking about the 12 to 18 month time frame. We're talking about a five year time frame or possibly even a 10 year time frame because it takes so long to actually pull Spectrum together from other sources. One of the things I wanted to mention, though, is that what has become increasingly um, interesting and perhaps difficult for us as we manage our networks is that to the consumer, they don't care what we're operating on. But to us, as a network provider, we currently have spectrum. And I'm going to throw out numbers and people <coughs> who don't do spectrum that's going to be you know, gobbledygook. But it's 700, 850, 1.7 with 2.1, and 1.9. We are on all four of those frequencies. The next big you know, tranche of spectrum that's likely to come up for auction is 600 megahertz, so that would be another frequency. There is also you know, talk there. We don't have a spectrum up in 2.5, but companies like Clearwire operate in those ranges. And on top of which, in our devices, we also have spectrum Wi-Fi chips. So we, we actually, as a network provider, have to manage all these different um, uh, pieces of spectrum that are out there. And this is only going to get worse because, because they're, they're, it is extremely difficult because of the way spectrum has been allocated and assigned over the years to find contiguous bits of spectrum that will allow you to be a lot more, um, uh, you know, to, to allow you to, to pull that spectrum together in a way that um, is much easier from a technical point of view. I just throw that out because I want everybody here to understand that it is, you know, when we talk about having more spectrum available as an operator, it's very important, but it also presents some interesting challenges. Um, that said, uh, what I also wanted to just talk about is really more what I spend my time doing, which is thinking about 
you know, how do we actually get spectrum um, down the road? And there are probably three ways that we look at it. One is, uh, you know, it, it, what the commission is doing, what the Federal Co um, Communications Commission is doing now is, is more looking at sort of market approaches. The incentive auction is a way for um, uh, broadcasters who may no longer be interested in per um, participating in that industry to actually make their spectrum available for sale that you know we and other carriers could come in and buy. So that's one way. Another market approach is for them what they've done, for example, in the satellite world, and they've said, well, we gave you your um, spectrum for satellite purposes, but we are now actually going to give you flexibility to do terrestrial. So that's one piece. Another piece that you know Mary also talked about is federal government spectrum. And we have been working, and you know, Michael probably can talk about that better than anyone since he sits on something called the spectrum. Uh, the Commerce Spectrum Management Advisory um, Committee, CSMAC, uh, which is, you know, the process is a very long, arduous process working with the federal government to move spectrum off of that. And then the third way, and then I'll, I'll stop and, you know, can move on to Derek, is through secondary markets because there's still, there's still spectrum that is probably not being used as efficiently as it can be. And it's not just, that what's interesting is, you know, we did a big deal, you know, previous, uh, um, closed it about, you know, less than a year ago with um, David's company and purchased spectrum on the secondary market. But there's also a lot of spectrum, like sort of onesies and twosies that is assigned and allocated for very specific reasons, but you can't use it without going back to the commission. To, to ask permission. Now, that may not be something that my company is interested in, but other innovators might be. And right now, there isn't a way to kind of what I refer to as clearing the underbrush on secondary markets, which I think is a very, you know, it may not seem like it, it's a, you know, hit it out of the ballpark kind of um, activity, but I think it's very important for the long haul for innovation in this sector. Hey, Derek, I mean, I, th I think we've been kind of talking about where this is all going in the, in the, the networks in the near future and how people interact with their devices. Um, you know, where do you see all this going and, and where, how do you see you know, consumers interacting with their devices? Absolutely. Um, so I, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about uh, both issues, both the unlocking and jailbreaking issue and also the offloading issue. Uh, so what we want to see here in this market is, in my mind, three critical things in the offloading, uh, on the um, spectrum side. We want user prioritization so they can prioritize how they want to use their data. We want more compression and we want more offloading. And so the question is, are we going to see that from the major market participants? Perhaps. But these are also the same market participants that have charged thousands of percent above actual text message rates until recently when they are now displaced by GroupMe and other applications on your phone that now send more text messages than the native text message software. These are the same companies that were caught having voicemail uh, drone on for extra minutes because that voicemail call makes them money on the end. If each user has to spend an extra minute on that voicemail call, it aggregates to the billions of dollars for these wireless companies. So real innovation is going to come from potentially new market participants or existing market participants that are pushed to innovate. And so the question is, would new market participants be able to innovate in this market today? And there are two technologies that are critical for more innovation for new market participants, which are unlocking and jailbreaking slash rooting, which is basically the same thing. And the reason I say that is without those technologies, if you're a new market participant, you're not going to be able to use the iPhone. You're not going to be able to use these cutting edge platforms unless you have a exclusive contract. So I want to introduce you to one company in particular, which is called Republic Wireless. Now Republic Wireless, offers a service where if you're in a Wi-Fi zone, you are offloaded 100%. And if you're not in a Wi-Fi zone, it jumps on Sprint. $20 a month, all you can eat, all you can call, all you can text, all you can use on the internet. Really a competitive software that undercuts the market by perhaps 60, 80%. But one of their dif mo biggest difficulties is they don't have the relationships with Apple for the iPhone. So what could help a company like that? the ability for consumers to bring over an unlock phone to their service. And it's going to be companies like Republic Wireless that are going to figure out how to offload better than we're doing today. That are going to be able to figure out how to prioritize applications better than we do today. You know, I get a text message from AT&T saying I'm 50% done with my spectrum for the month or my cap. And then it says you're 80%. And then it says you're 90%. And I'm sitting there and I'm saying, okay, well, what do I do? What, well, how do I not go over that? 
Um, you know what? And and so I'm, I'm a tech guy. I, I stop streaming stuff. I, I don't go on the internet as often. I stop tweeting, and it goes 95 percent. And then I get a, a text message saying 110 percent. So. Can we prioritize better than that? Can we have a system better than this text message? I think so. But is that going to come from AT&T and Verizon and T-Mobile? Perhaps. It's probably more likely to come from a new market participant. Are we going to have technologies that are going to push compression to the next level? That could come from the major market participants, but it may come from these new ones as well. And so that's why unlocking and jailbreaking are really critical to a dynamic market because jailbreaking and rooting allows for these new technologies to be built from the ground up. And if even 5% of American users have a jailbroken or rooted phone, you're able to see real experimentation of what is possible on a phone platform. And we have 23 million jailbroken devices in the world. So it's 23 million iPhones to play around with, to do things that Apple may not let you do. And so that's one market of 23 million people. But what works on that market can actually be carried over to the broader market. So again, those three things, user prioritization, compression, and offloading. And those things are, are helped by more competition outside of the big three. And, and David, uh, I think uh, he's, he's referring to the big three. And you're not one of the big three I think he's referring to. But you are a, a big player. I'm sorry, is this a wireless panel? I'm with Comcast. <laughs> 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 Didn't realize what I was doing. Or actually, most of you probably are wondering why Comcast is here. And you just assume since we're a platinum sponsor, we had to find a space for me. <laughs> But it, it turns out I'm actually one of these uh, innovators in the wireless space that Derek is talking about. Uh, many of you may not know, but Comcast, along with the other cable companies, are in the process today of building the largest Wi-Fi network in the United States. Together, today, we already have over 100 and I think 125,000 Wi-Fi hotspots, and that number is going to be growing exponentially over the next few years. At Comcast, I think we have over uh, 50,000 Wi-Fi hotspots. And the goal of this uh, investment is to deal with a lot of these um, uh, issues we've been discussing here today. We think it's important for our customers to be able to get that broadband experience in the home, outside of the home. So what we do is we give our customers, for no additional charge, access to this Wi-Fi network. So anyone here who's an Xfinity customer can get onto our Xfinity hotspots all around town. In fact, here in Washington, just pulling up the app, Right within this area, there look like there are about 30, 40 hotspots just within probably less than a square half mile. From so there. we were inaccurate when we say we had our black zone of Wi-Fi. You actually probably cover this area. Uh, we do cover it. I just put, we have an app just pulling it up. Within a few blocks of here, there are hotspots. But the nature of Wi-Fi is a pretty limited range of about 100 feet from the hotspot itself. So I'm not sure if we have coverage in here. Uh, but we do have it all around town. And the idea is to expand our customers' footprints. Uh, or expand our customers' access, I should say, to the um, internet. But one of the issues we are dealing with is the same issues that Charles was talking about on the licensed side, which is something of a spectrum crunch. And we have the same issue on the unlicensed side. All of this traffic is being offloaded from the wireline networks. Either you guys are doing it yourselves when your devices switch to Wi-Fi, or your carrier is doing it for you when they're trying to encourage you to switch to Wi-Fi. Like when you go home, for example, and your phone automatically defaults. But that Wi-Fi spectrum is getting very congested. And um, we have some important policy issues that the FCC is taking up today. And really, Congress told uh, the FCC and the uh, NTIA to take up last year during the, in the uh, a provision of the Middle Class Tax Relief Act. So what we'd like to see is more of a balanced focus on spectrum policy around the country, around our agencies both in Congress and at the FCC, where we are looking at this unlicensed spectrum crunch and making sure that when we talk about the future of spectrum policy in this country, we're balancing out the two. Because we're going to have um, eventually, hopefully, one of the largest Wi-Fi networks in the world. And to do that, we're going to need to feed it with more spectrum. So Wi-Fi and uh, innovation here go hand in hand. And we're, we're part of what Derek's talking about. He re refers to Republic Wireless. But on the wireless front, I think we're in that same camp as well. Sure. And Michael, you have kind of cleanup. Um, you have a lot of fodder to to kind of finish up the 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 panel okay. um, opening statements. I guess I can take off a bit uh, from where David David ended, which is what what he was uh, describing is really part of what you might call the happiest uh, contradiction in telecom policy today, uh, which is the gap between claims of a looming spectrum crisis, which is focused, you know, on on. I think exclusively licensed spectrum and auctions, 
and the reality that consumers rely increasingly on unlicensed spectrum to satisfy the exploding demand for video, music, and other high bandwidth apps that Mary described. I mean, it wasn't very many years ago, right, before the iPhone, virtually all mobile traffic was routed over a carrier's exclusively licensed spectrum and through cell towers and other very expensive carrier infrastructure. But today, less than two-thirds of smartphone traffic and less than 10% of, of iPad data uh, travels over carrier networks. And now there's projections that that's going to uh, closer to 65 to 70% in a few years. The rest is transmitted a very short distance at low power over unlicensed spectrum and into a wireline network that the end user or their employer or some other business uh, you know, has already provisioned. Since most video and other high bandwidth apps on mobile devices are used in, mostly indoors and with range of a, of a wired local area network, um, this is, offload is really the single most important factor in mitigating the spectrum crunch. Uh, the importance of, of unlicensed and spectrum band sharing becomes more clear when, if you stop and distinguish uh, between truly mobile data demand, which is, say, in a car uh, or on the go, and nomadic data demand, which is in a home, office, cafe, or public space. Uh, because um, increasingly, you know, there will be that Wi-Fi everywhere. A Cisco survey last year found that mobile devices are used 80% of the time at home, at work, or in locations with wired networks that either do or could easily uh, offer Wi-Fi offload. That is 85% of the, of the hours on the, on the mobile device. Video is driving overall demand, and most video traffic is migrating uh, to Wi-Fi. Wi-Fi is becoming ubiquitous in all the places that users typically uh, use high bandwidth apps, such as video streaming and video calling. Uh, that same Cisco survey uh, also found that both individual and business users prefer using Wi-Fi. Given a choice, more than 80% of tablet, laptop, and e-reader e owners, and 50% of smartphone users either prefer Wi-Fi to mobile access or have no preference. Users said they prefer Wi-Fi for reasons of cost, first of all, to, to avoid data usage caps, and also because they find it much faster than mobile networks. So as high capacity wireline networks become more ubiquitous, the ability of mobile devices to transmit data short distances over shared spectrum into less traffic sensitive wired networks can replace the spectrum crunch with wireless bandwidth abundance. Um, which doesn't mean we don't need you know, more of both flavors of spectrum. But a key policy obstacle to this pro-consumer outcome, as David mentioned, is progress on the FCC's effort to open the most underutilized uh, bands, uh, particularly underused federal government bands and portions of the mostly empty TV band for unlicensed sharing. I'll stop there. Yeah, um, that's great. Um, if I can circle back with Alex, um, somebody was saying to me, like, when I when I described what you were gonna, your comments were gonna be about. Um, you know, why, why you, I think you touched upon this, why do you really care? Um, it's mm -hmm. not your network, you, you're servicing uh, your customers, it's somebody else's problem to deal with that, that bandwidth issue. Um, I remember back, you know, many years ago in the early 2000s, let's say, um, you know, as people were kind of coming up against, you know, DSL limits and dial-up limits, um, people were installing, um, you know, ad blockers on their, on their browsers that would kind of, you know, eliminate the, the the header uh, advertisement, the kind of skyscraper advertisement, you know, just try to get, you know, faster, faster downloads of content. How long have you seen this coming and how long have you been working on, you know, this, yeah. this initiative? Well, I, I start by saying there's really two things that scare me in terms of discussions. One really is just this idea that I get a text message to tell me to stop using my data services. You know, I get this, this, this ever glowing bar that says, stop doing it, stop using it. <laughs> uh, our, the growth industry in this, uh, in this country, as we've seen from the, 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 the speakers earlier, is really coming from this tech sector, from apps, from other mobile services. And while a chunk of that traffic is going to go over to Wi-Fi, the idea that we might be trying to punish users into not using those applications is a really terrifying thought, particularly for me and my business. Uh, I mean, the, the second comment really would be that while we're all sat here in the room using, using our data services, using, using our phones, 
we, we often, regardless of the quality of our, our friends' networks, uh, we see them dip in and out. And I can be sat there trying to wait for something to load, wait for something to, to sit. And while there may be still bandwidth available today, that congestion is only going to get worse. So I think anything which either punishes consumers for using these data services or provides a less than adequate experience is something which is going to turn people off. And as people shift to mobile, really we're going to do harm to that, to that, to that fledgling industry. In terms of the data caps that you talked about though, while uh, people have tried to block ads in the past, the reason really that they've done that is because those ads were not that good. I think people uh, saw these banner ads flashing, fitted on the page, and, and it really didn't either appeal to them from a relevancy point of view, which comes to perhaps the questions of some of the previous panelists around trying to find the right ad for the right person, or just the format was unappealing. Uh, I, 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 once, uh, I once watched the editor of Vogue on a panel, and she said to the audience, who were primarily online marketers, whenever I uh, whenever I ask people what they like about my website, their number one complaint is the ads. But nobody ever complains about the ads in my magazine. And if you think about it, when you flip through Vogue, the, the ads that you see there are beautiful, they're aspirational, they're great pieces of imagery, and they fit perfectly with the experience of reading that magazine. So if there's one thing that publishers like ourselves are trying to do, is to say, well, what is it about magazine ads that are so great that really people don't object to? Uh, and why is it we're not doing that online? And frankly, the one reason has been bandwidth. Those ads are big, they're beautiful, they require high resolution photography or video, and only now are we getting to a point where we can start to deliver that content. Uh, just towards the end of the, uh, or just, just a few months ago really, we launched a new application on our Android platform which integrated what we call branded backgrounds, it's a bit of an industry term, but we put this high quality aspirational imagery right there at the background of our weather application. Uh, very well received by advertisers and much less obtrusive than the banner advertising that you saw before. However, a bigger download. This is the value exchange we talked about and if people really feel and fear that this is coming from their bandwidth cap and it's going to you know, uh, contribute towards this punishment that the industry is going to put on there, people are going to stop using those data services. And I, I really plead with people to try and do, do more to help me with that. Mary? So Alex, I want to put you at ease. I actually have a, some data on data caps that will be interesting uh, to share with you guys. Because um, Cisco has taken a look at the effect of data caps on consumer usage of their mobile devices. And what we're seeing as of uh, September of 2012 is that customers on tiered plans, so plans that have limits, right? Their traffic is growing faster year over year than the bulk of the customers who still remain on the unlimited plans in the US, which indicates to us that whatever the data caps are for the different carriers, and different carriers will have different ones, those are not yet proving to be a constraint on consumer usage. Yes, we're gonna have the anecdotal case where you have the heavy user who hits that data cap, but as a group, their, their data usage is growing faster year over year, 117% year over year compared to the unlimited users whose data is growing 71% year over year. That's interesting. I have a few things to say to that. Well, one, I, I've hit my data cap every month. Um, why don't I get a receipt saying you hit your data cap and here's kind of an aggregate of, of why? I mean, some of the information is difficult to dispel, but um, I think that that type of information would be useful for consumers to know. Uh, and and for there is, yeah, I, I, my understanding in, there's in the an app for that. There yes. is, I and there's it. also in the planning process for this. There was um, there was a discussion that there's there's a group, a consortium of folks working together to try to figure out um, how the best way to meter and, and give accurate data um, analysis to customers. So I think that's that's working itself out. And there's also you know apps. And I, but, Verizon's pretty good. But at isn't that. there another way to interpret the data that you just talked about, which is those who are on the unlimited plan are being grandfathered in, and those who are on the tiered plan are those who are the early adapters the ones who are using the newest technology, the ones who are upgrading for the new phone every two years, the ones who are downloading the latest app, the ones who we shouldn't be surprised are using the most data. I'm just making the point that if data caps were a significant constraint on that group, we wouldn't see their growth substantially ahead. And we're seeing it substantially ahead. It, this data point requires more investigation in the future, and we intend to return to this and try to understand it better. But, but the, 
the, the first point we can see is that this does not appear to be a constraint yet. And um, our expectation is that as consumer data use grows, that carriers will probably consider adjusting those data caps. Hmm. Let me, um, let me jump in. Oh yeah, please do. I mean, so what we're saying here that there seems to be unanimous agreement is that consumers are using these devices more and more, mm -hmm. and we have to figure out how to make them more accessible to consumers. Yes. And that's on, you know, whether it's Verizon on their network, AT&T or Republic or on our network, and we have to facilitate that usage and make sure that we're coming up with policies that make these networks more robust and more available to everyone so that we don't have to deal with, and no one's happy about Alex or Derek having to cut back his usage. I mean, everyone, right, we want to generate revenue and ads, we want to have ads that he's going to read. So we just have to figure out a way how we supply this underlying spectrum to everyone so that these networks can continue to be robust and handle the increase, what we all know is uh, exponentially increasing usage. Yeah, and, I, and I'd actually also add, like to add something to this because the conversation we're having here is all about, you know, I know when Mary's company pulls the data together, she pulls it together from um, all the different companies that are uh, providing services now. And what we're looking at is, in fact, what we, w the current trajectory, and we're projecting out. What we're not doing, and it's, it's funny, I was talking about this earlier, there's actually another um, a conference that was going on earlier that was uh, across town that was talking about things like M Health and telematics and other things. We aren't actually even considering what we as a nation believe is actually a very important part of what we need for future economic growth, which is more connected services and more wirelessly connected services. And that's not even incorporated into her estimates of growth at this point. So, you know, I, I appreciate what you're saying, and I think it's a very important um, component of understanding this. But in order for us to actually want to move forward as a nation and, you know, get the kinds of services out there that we think are very important for rural communities, for other communities, we're actually going to need these numbers should go up even more significantly than they have been. And also, to Michael's point, the one thing I want to point out, and this gets into statistical things, is you were talking about um, you know, how much Wi-Fi offload, but you have to remember that that's against a backdrop of incredibly increasing um, use generally. So mm -hmm. while that is you know, a, a bigger portion, it's a bigger portion of a much, much bigger pie. So meanwhile, while the Wi-Fi offload is growing, so is, you know, the license use that we're seeing as well. I mean, it's mm -hmm. just, it's all growing in a phenomenal way. And, you know, to get back to your earlier point, is part of what we were going to be talking about today is things that we actually are doing to, to mitigate these. And frankly, one of the things that we did is, you know, in less than five years, we are completely changing out our network from 3G to 4G, which, I'm sorry, I actually offload a lot of times. I will get on the LTE network rather than be on Wi-Fi because it's, in fact, faster. I find that to be fairly frequently the case. And, you know, we will be completely LTE by, you know, mid-year um, this year at, you know, speeds that are not, you know, the same as Xfinity, but they're very good speeds for a mobile network, and it is a much more efficient technology than the one that we're, um, you know, that you know we, we currently are using. So it's just it's just an example of you know that's just one thing. There are numerous other things I could talk about that we do in our network to conserve spectrum, but you know that's that's a pretty big one, and it was a very expensive. Can I address one other point? I want well, let me let me just let me just um, go. Um, I want uh, there's questions for the audience, which I, I, I promise to get to, um, and I also want to punctuate what Alex was saying. Um, it, this the, the idea as I've been saying all day is like what idiot came up with the idea of state of the mobile net? Is there any difference between the mobile net and, and the regular internet? And what we've all been saying is that no, people are doing exactly the same things using wireless devices as they are. Um, on, on their laptops or their PCs. Uh, there, with the, and there's a, there's a robust, and we haven't talked about this at all, there's a robust landline uh, network that services all the Wi-Fi and the small cells and, and the networks that we have. So in a way, um, there is no difference. But I think, you know, in, in, in reference to Tim Berners-Lee, we're going to celebrate um, in about 20 minutes with, with a cocktail. Uh, we've had a 20-year tw run of the World Wide Web. It's been a pretty good run. And in a way, it's been largely subsidized by advertising. Um, and it, we've been very fortunate. When I mentioned back in the early 2000s that you had these kind of these technologies that would block ads just for bandwidth efficiencies, you know, that, that's really that's really scary. Um, and we kind of got past that. And I think what everybody's saying is that we're, we're in a space where we're trying to move past that again. Um, but 
uh, let me just go right, we have a question over here, and, and please, um, any other questions that we have? Is this, is this to me? Uh, well, actually, I would I would argue sure, that the government. Yeah. I know there's a lot of pushback against that, but are there any other chances for major sales that could help develop effective networks? Well, I, I would argue that the government actually holds a fair amount of spectrum that would be, you know, and, and we're, you know, several of us at this table have been working with them. Um, on this point, but that would be another source, a major source of a uh, significant amount of spectrum. Um, that yeah, I and I would, others want to. I would just add that that is, you know, that's one of the reasons that we think, you know, you have to put out, you have to put more spectrum out there. Um, you know, for, yes. we'll get some for apparently for auction, these incentive auctions, for example, but we also have to open. As Charlotte said, the, you know, the, the federal bans, there's huge, the President's Council of Advisors of Science and Technology, great report last uh, summer that pointed out there's like a thousand megahertz um, of, of pretty good spectrum that's very extremely underutilized. And if we could share that, at least it would open more bandwidth. Because if we don't have more spectrum bandwidth of both, you know, licensed and unlicensed, then there's not going to be room for competition because you can see that the, the spectrum is one of the things driving consolidation in the industry. Uh, and, and so more spectrum is going to relieve those pressures, create more room for more competition. Um, and I, I would just say, as David said in his comments, I think releasing more spectrum at 5 gigahertz uh, to help Wi-Fi bear the burden of offloading is important, and the FCC is looking at that, uh, which is terrific. Um, and I think the PCAS report brought up specifically the, uh, uh, you know, significant blocks of spectrum at 3.5 that could also be used potentially for offloading as well. So um, there's, there's other, um, other blocks of spectrum that can be put to work to address the, uh, the growing rise of mobile data traffic. Uh, Tiffany, uh, could you just identify yourself? So I guess I can address some of this with our Wi-Fi network. Um, you know, well, we have first of all, our Wi-Fi network is a locked network, so you have to have access. You have to get access to it, and one way you get access is by being an Xfinity customer. So we authenticate you once um, before you log on, so that we know who you are. So that's some added form of security, and uh, we know that you're an Xfinity or a customer of another cable company with whom we share access. So that's one thing. Um, the second thing is once you are accessing the Wi-Fi hotspot, you're really immediately, at least in our case, and I think in most cases, on our very secure DOCSIS 3 cable network. So all of the security beyond the access point is within the network, and that's there immediately. And then within the access point, the security there is, is a standard Wi-Fi login, and then we have this authentication. So we take security, you know, security is an important issue, and, um, but I think there's Wi-Fi is really just the access point to a huge wire line or, or wired uh, network. So I'm not sure it, anything changes very much. Yeah, if I can mention uh, on, a bigger, on a bigger scale um, what David's describing, because it's, it's good to know like what's happening overseas is actually this offloading, but on much larger scale. So for example, British Telecom, they're a, they're a, a wire line provider, uh, but they have now created uh, 5 million hotspots uh, on their customers' uh, you know, wire lines. And what they do is they, uh, they give people a home hub, essentially a, a wireless router, and they assign both a, a private uh, SSID and a public. Uh, and, and 
so, so the customer's data is, is, is completely separate, as David said, you know, tunnels through BT's own network, but so does the public access. So any, any of their subscribers can go, you know, London is just completely blanketed with Wi-Fi coverage because every, almost every home and business that's a BT subscriber, you know, has this. And it's, and it's you know, from what I hear, it's, it's pretty secure for the reasons that David mentioned, and it's huge. I think it is in that there's an authentication in there. Even on the BT system Michael's describing, you have to be part of the network so they at least can identify you. So, you know, down the line, if, if yeah. there's a Kalia yeah. type of inquiry. I, mean, I think what you're talking about here is a little bit of consumer education as well. Uh, many best practices are not followed. So, f for example, if a hotspot pops up that says Xfinity 2, <laughs> is somebody going to click it? And if it looks like they connected, do they think it's Xfinity, even if it's somebody else masquerading as an Xfinity hotspot? That, that, right. that really is a challenge that I think is more w what you're addressing here. Best practices like only sending personally identifiable information over SSL is something which bigger companies, ourselves included, only do, whereas I think many smaller sites so far are still to adopt some of these best practices. That, that certainly goes a long way towards mitigating most of those security issues. Well, um, let me just uh, ask the panel to kind of end with the, the basic premise. Um, are we going to be able to get through this um, period of time uh, without really having a catastrophe, or are we totally screwed? <laughs> <laughs> just in, in closing, all the way down the line. Um, I, I, uh, I'm a veteran of the FCC and appreciate their professionalism, and I'm hoping their voluntary incentive auction is going to deliver a fabulous amount of spectrum. Uh, that will help the licensed carriers and that they'll be able to uh, expand the amount of spectrum available for small cell, both in the Wi-Fi 5 band as well as other bands. And I have my fingers crossed that the feds over at NTIA will open up some government spectrum as well. So I, I will say my glass is half full. <laughs> I, think, I think when an industry is growing this fast, I think money is a powerful incentive and the companies involved will find a way. Charlie? I guess I have to, right? <laughs> I have to find a way. No, I'm, I'm, I'm with Mary. The glass is half full. I, there, it, it, it will. It's tremendously hard work, though, in some of these fronts. Very complicated, very hard work. But I think it's, I think it's doable. I think it has to be. We have to want to do this, and it's an important goal. Derek. I think we can do it, but I think we can increase spectrum and do all the things we're talking about here without making 23 million Americans felons for jailbreaking their phones and seeing what new market models, new innovators can bring to the market that may be able to address this issue. Mm -hmm. I hate to be an optimist as well with everybody else. I will, I will <laughs> note, historically, the FCC moves very slowly. Our agencies and Congress moves very slowly. And if you look at... Um, just the progress made in the last three years since the broadband plan was adopted, uh, it's been quite remarkable. I mean, we had the, the idea of an incentive auction went from written down in a report to past legislation in, three, in two years. And that's really remarkable. Just to give you a context, and Michael's heard me say this before, the idea of spectrum auctions was first broached in 1959 and the very first spectrum auction was held in 1992 or 93. 90. So great ideas often take a long time in Washington to become reality, but we seem to be moving a lot quicker in this space, I think given the consumer pressures and the uh, economic opportunities it brings, uh, there's reason to think that we'll be able to move quickly and making some progress here. Yeah, I'll, I'll join the chorus of, <laughs> oh, of, of optimists. Uh, <laughs> well, just in, at least half full, and I, and I think it's partly because um, even aside from the FCC, both companies and consumers have a number of tools at their disposal. And so they'll, you know, companies can split, split cells, uh, you know, even more aggressively. Consumers can move to, what, to these offloading. And as David said, the commission has been moving much faster than in the past. And let's just hope they continue to do so. But it's going to take a lot of resolve by the administration because right now the military is, I think, one of the major obstacles to getting a lot of the good spectrum uh, freed up uh, uh, for sharing and for licensing. Um, well, uh, David just mentioned 1993, which coincidentally was the year that the World Wide Web was born. 
And um, so we'd like to um, you know, raise a glass to Sir Tim Berners-Lee. He spoke to the Congressional Internet Caucus in 2001. He was not a Serb then. He was not quite, quite knighted. Um, but he spoke to us in, in 2001. And in 1996, the Congressional Internet Caucus was created because at the time, that time in the 96 Telecom Act, the vast majority of United States senators thought that um, the World Wide Web was a blue binder full of porn. Uh, so uh, that's why the Congressional Internet Caucus was created to kind of raise awareness of these issues and try to uh, have solid debates about the importance of the issues. And, and we really thank you for coming out. Um, please join us for our cocktail in honor of the, uh, the World Wide Web. We have a signature cocktail for Sir Tim Berners-Lee called the Sir Tini. There you go. And then, um, and but I especially want to thank uh, everybody today, the sponsors, IAB, Google, um, AT&T, and Comcast. And I want to thank this fam fabulous panel. Thank you so much.